Welcome to Camera Ready and Able, the podcast that explores the intersection of media change and personal growth. I'm your host, Barbara Barna Abel, and my calling is to help you tap into your superpowers, hone your message, and make an impact on the world. Today's episode is brought to you by the phrase, career transitions. According to research, we will all have up to seven careers in a lifetime with an average of 12 different jobs. So in a way, we're all sort of transitioning all the time, but there's a unique subset of people who transitions more publicly and I think with more difficulty than the rest of us. And I am of course talking about pop stars. And to be clear, I am not being glib. This is something I actually think about because when let's say an accountant or your dentist decides to change careers, shut down their office, pursue their bliss, no one or rarely does anyone say they were a failed dentist or accountant. But when a pop star or almost any performer transitions to a different career, there is, in my opinion, often stigma. So when my guest for this episode, writer and journalist Nick Duerden, published an excerpt from his upcoming book, Exit Stage Left, in The Guardian, I did a little cyber stalking and asked if he would discuss this on the podcast. And I'm thrilled to say that Nick said yes. So welcome, Nick. Please come on in and welcome to Camera Ready and Able. Hello, Barbara. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. So my first obvious question is what motivated you? What was the impetus to actually think of writing this book and reach out to all these people and ask this question? Um, I guess if the honest answer is probably age. I'm old now. I've been doing this job for about 30 years. So when I started, I was in my very early 20s and I would interview bands who were also in their very early 20s. And at that stage, they were in full possession of their cheekbones. They, they had confidence to burn. They were convinced they were going to take over the world. They were going to be the new Beatles, the new Stones, the new Madonna, whoever. And I completely believed it just as much as they did. And then as I continued, I, I diversified and I wrote lots of different things, but I never fully left music journalism behind. So I found I would interview them again five years later, or maybe even 15 years later, when they hadn't quite become the new Beatles or the Stones, or maybe in some cases they had. But in that interim, life had happened to them. And I thought their stories became more interesting as life goes on in the way that all of our lives become, our life stories become more interesting. You know, that youthful ambition is replaced with hard-won wisdom, maybe depression, maybe all sorts of things come into the mix. So yeah, I'd, I'd interview them when they were 31 and then 41. And in some cases, even older, they'd had kids in that time. They'd been married perhaps more than once. Maybe they'd had some addictions. Maybe they'd experienced bankruptcy or the zeitgeist had gone left while they had gone right and they were no longer as famous or successful anymore. And sometimes they were pleased or relieved by that, being able to kind of step off the merry-go-round. And in other cases, they were quite angry that their time had come and gone quicker than they had perhaps liked. And I found that when I did get to go back to re-interview them, I, it was just fascinating. And I kept on thinking, there's more to write here. And also, as someone who writes books as well as journalism, it's very difficult to persuade a magazine or a newspaper editor to interview a band on their seventh or their tenth album because their story has been told. You know, the music business thrives on novelty and youth and vigor. If a band is on their, lucky enough, in inverted commas, to be on their fifth or their eighth or ninth album, their story has been told. They're simply releasing another good album. There's nothing to say. And of course, there is a lot to say, but perhaps you don't get to say that in a, in a weekend supplement in the New York Times or in The Guardian. You say it in a book. So just as we were going into lockdown, I started reaching in, out to to stars from all different genres uh, of all different ages, so from the late 60s to, I suppose, the early 2000s, to ask if they may want to talk to me about what it's like to still be a musician in some form or respect and to manage to eke out a career in a, um, in a business that I suppose prizes novelty over experience. And fortunately for me, quite a few people said yes. Wow. There, there, there's so much in that awesome explanation because yes, we talked about this before we started recording. Cause I, I too started my career in the music business. I worked in college radio and I was an intern at Virgin records in the UK. Okay. Oh, wow. Right. 
Oh, yeah. In Vernon Yard in the heyday of Culture Club and Human League. And I was there for the 10th anniversary of Tubular Bells. Okay. And then I also interned at AM, AM Records in Los Angeles. I bring all this up because everything was on vinyl. I, I'm old enough to remember, like, you know, when, you know, CDs were new, let alone, you know, the transition to digital. And I don't mean to get off on a different tangent, but it's like, to your point, there's a very big difference between being a musician and making music and being a pop star or running the career mm. of, of having that. And so we're going to get into that in a second, because I think that that shows up a lot in your article and I can't wait to read your book, which I, I haven't had a chance to get my hands on yet. But some things that you said that are so interesting in the article, the descriptors you used, one was the curious afterlife of pop stars, which I just love. And I do feel like that could be a TV show. <laughs> you refer to this as the awkward next chapter, which I love. And then this was so good. You kind of touched on this when anonymity replaces infamy and how do we deal with this? And that you found so many of your interview subjects still tenacious, driven and inspiration, inspirational. But what I love the most was this, and this is what stood out. They dared to dream. And so when you were talking to them when they were young, they were people who dared to dream. And that's a really big deal that gets lost in all of this. I don't, I don't think we all forget about it is that like, it takes so much, so much guts yeah. and tenacity and, and huge dreams to say, here's this, here's the music that I make. And can I share it with you? I just thought it was huge. I don't think I've ever interviewed um, a pop star or I guess for that matter, an actor who has become famous and successful by accident. You know, they are perhaps in a literal sense, extraordinary. You know, I never, I never had such grand dreams and I don't think I went to school or to college with people who had those enormous dreams. I remember the first time I interviewed a pop star, perhaps I was 18, 19, and I was incredibly excited but and terrified and I kind of came away bewildered and I thought, wow, there are people out there who have that level of self-belief. The first interview I did, she's actually in the book. Um, do you remember Transvision Vamp from the mid to late 80s? Front yes. by Wendy James. Well, they, wow. they were briefly very successful here, huge in America for a very short space of time. One member went on to be uh, the bassist, I think, in, in Bush. So he went on to have some really big success. But Wendy James was just the finished article at the age of 20. And she told me, you know, you have to understand that this was in a pub in the Portobello Road, West London. She was exuding confidence. I was trying not to let my knees shake too much, you know, sitting in front of a real life pop star. I'd only ever seen them on TV before then. And she told me that her band were going to have world domination, that she was going to win Grammys and Emmys and Oscars. And she didn't say any of it with a kind of twitch or, or, or self-consciousness. She believed it. And, and I just thought I'd never met a human being like this. And that was a really good introduction to, to what it takes to be a pop star. As you touched on earlier, the, those, those two wanting to write music and be a musician and, and becoming famous are two very different things, aren't they? They Pop stars, once they start becoming marketed, are it's quite a shock to the system because they become a product. And of course, they don't always respond well to that. And, you know, who can blame them? But I guess that's what happened when you have that level of ambition and talent and you are lucky enough to be signed by a record label. The record label is going to push you down that conveyor belt and make you famous. And not everybody, you know, not everybody takes to it in the same way. But as you said earlier, the idea that these people are brave enough and audacious enough to follow their dreams all the way through is, is quite remarkable. And everybody I interviewed in the book, I just came away reeling in admiration. I, I kind of felt they could easily reinvent themselves as self-help practitioners because they have this air of positivity that would that we could all learn from. Oh, wait, I want to hear more about this. So who really surprised you with this? In, in a way, if I'm honest, all of them, because life had happened to all of them. So I think the youngest person, I could be wrong here, I'm looking at the, at the track listing of the book now, but maybe the youngest person is in their late 30s or early 40s and the oldest is in their 70s. And so some have maintained a level of superstardom, others stardom, and others really did only have 15 minutes or in some cases, one hit wonders. But they may not be playing Madison Square Garden or Wembley Stadium and they're, they're playing the local pub, but it, or they're playing a nostalgia circuit and it brings them enormous pleasure. So they, they kind of keep going. And even those people who had to take day jobs because they didn't make enough money 
from music alone. A lot of them still play music at the weekends. They still they can't kind of walk away. I, I think I say in the book that if if you try to leave music, it calls you back. And another unique thing in this art form is that your songs work on your behalf forever. So you may only have conjured up that magic once in 1978 or in 1985 when inspiration struck. You wrote a brilliant song and you never managed to write a song as good as that. But the song is still there and the song is being rediscovered by the next generation. The song is being covered by new artists or a mobile phone wants to use it for their latest advertising campaign or a film wants to use it as a soundtrack. So the first thing that that does is give you a, an injection of cash, but it also reminds tour promoters that you still exist. So they ask if you want to go on tour. If you've split up with the band acrimoniously, you make that awkward phone conversation and say, look, you know, they, they want us again. We're, we're back again. And that phone call I found is very difficult for anyone in any area to turn down because I said it in that Guardian piece, didn't I? It must be nice to be quite so loudly loved. So to have a chance of that again, to be up there on stage and have everyone cheering up at you. Yeah, it's clearly very nice and very tempting, which is why I suppose no band really ever fully retires, or at least most bands don't fully retire. They get tempted back. Mm. Well, one, let's celebrate the fact that what a big deal it is to have written one hit song. Yeah, absolutely. That's like one of like my dream parallel universe things. Like <laughs> that would be so amazing because statistically that's extremely rare. And to have had that gift for a shining moment is incredible, yeah. let alone to write two or three or that the muse kept coming. So that's amazing. I want to go back for a second and ask you, was there any through line that you discovered for those? Because this is where I'm curious, is those who took other kinds of jobs was the emotional transition there. And one of the reasons I'm asking, because in my field, I've worked with a number of comedians, actors, performers who ended up transitioning from performing to behind, you know, to be going successful writers, directors, producers, showrunners. Right. And I'm talking phenomenally successful, right? And so to me, they weren't failed at the first one. They just found out that their calling was the other thing. Yeah. You know, acting on stage or doing stand up was my gateway to doing what I was really supposed to be doing that I'm super amazing at. And I just think that that's often sometimes though forgotten in the, in the, um, in the bio. And so that's one of the things I was curious with, you know, in the sense of pop stars, it's like somebody might discover it's, you know, but I was an amazing parent or I was meant to, you know, cause you talked about some, you know, going on to teaching or yes. doing other things where you realize they have a phenomenal gift that they're sharing. And, and so anyway, I was just curious on the, my, my long-winded thing was, I was curious if, if that had emerged from you sort of any repeated things around the emotional side of that adjustment to when, and I think somebody referenced it in the article too, it's like, you know, when no one sends a car for you anymore. Yes. What I found was that many people did find it difficult to replace that one job pop star with something that was quite as fulfilling. Natalie Mer Merchant from 10,000 Maniacs, who you referred to, is, is one of the rare exceptions in that she was always an artist and she didn't really want to be successful. I'm sure she was very grateful when she received huge acclaim for her wonderful songs over, over many years. But she told me that she didn't like being marketed as a commodity when she would um, show up for photo shoots. The, the fashion designer there or the photographer there would say, can we get you in a, in a, in a bikini, in a swimming suit? And she said, look, this isn't the kind of band I want to be. And so she didn't really enjoy that. And then she took a step back from the band and she thought, well, I'll just be a quiet cult solo artist. But her first album sold, I think it's called Tiger Lily in 1995. It sold 5 million. So of course, then she was back on the treadmill because there was demand from all over the world. And of course, she enjoyed it, but she, she, she did want to do other things. And so more recently in life, She's taken a step back from music um, and she now teaches, she volunteers. She teaches arts and crafts to underprivileged children across New York State. And she, you know, just hearing in her voice, yeah, her voice lit up when she talked about it. She clearly found it incredibly worthwhile uh, work and she loved it. Um, somebody else I interviewed in the book, and I thought this was quite interesting and typical of perhaps many of the other interviews, is that 
when the Boomtown Rats kind of founded in the early 1980s, Bob Geldof was furious. He was 30 years old. They'd been famous and successful for 10 years, which perhaps is a long time in pop years. But as far as he was concerned, they'd only just begun. They were going to become one of the biggest bands in the world. Their fourth album kind of stumbled a bit, which shocked him. But he said, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. We'll, 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 you know, we'll make it all right on the fifth album. And he was convinced that was going to be a hit, but it didn't happen. So as every pop star who doesn't have a hit album will know, the phone stops ringing, uh, as it did, you know, back in the 1980s, long before email. And he had no pressing engagements, so he just went home and thought, well, what on earth do I do? I'm not supposed to be home. I'm supposed to be on stage. And that was the point at which he was flicking through TV channels, saw a news report from Ethiopia, and suddenly he had this new purpose. But even after feeding the world via Band Aid and Live Aid, which is something he still presides over today, and even after becoming um, an incredibly successful business person, uh, investing in tech companies and various other things, nothing gives him pleasure like music. So he was still doing solo stuff every now and then. One member of the Boomtown Rats would phone another member, say, should we give it another go? And at some point it was right. And the band got back together in 2019 and they were welcomed like returning heroes. And I think he was 66, 67 by this stage. And he'd never looked more alive than when he went back on stage. So even though he'd had a very fulfilling post-music career, there was something about music that was the most important thing of all. And many people that I interviewed did have gone on to do other things, whether in the industry, as you said, whether as producers or songwriters or maybe working, you know, in, in the back room, if you like. They want to return because, as we said before, not very much else compares. It's a job for life, even when it isn't. I was going to say it's also a calling. Yes. A lot of people said that it was a calling, that it wasn't something that they chose. I grew up listening to all sorts of music and mostly on, on, on the radio. I didn't have a record player. We couldn't afford to buy albums. So I just got everything from the radio. So I listened to everything. So as much as I was listening to the new romantic stuff and Adam Ant and Duran Duran and Echo and the Bunnymen, whatever else, I loved Joan Armour Trading. I just thought she was a genius and everything she did was amazing. And she was a fascinating interview for many reasons, but one was that she didn't want to be interviewed. She said yes out of politeness and she's very enigmatic. She's a bit like Kate Bush in that she just wants to go ahead doing what she does. She doesn't want to be in trend. She doesn't want to be out of trend. She couldn't care less what's going on in the charts. She just does what she does. And if anybody listens, fantastic. And she'll play to them. And she said to me that she never really wanted to be a, a singer. Growing up, she loved comedy. She loved listening to the goons on the radio, a 1950s comedy troupe from the UK. And it was, I think she was nine years old when her parents bought her a piano. She didn't know how to play, so she tried to play. And then these songs almost fell from the sky, threw her into the keys, and she wrote these songs. And she was, she attributes them as a gift from God. Or she says she has no idea where they came from, but she's very glad they come to her. So, yes, it's a calling, but the way she says it, they're not mine. They just come through me. So I, so I suppose if that's your attitude and your outlook to it, you can't really go off and do anything else, can you? You, you have to do it because you're capable of doing it. And as you said earlier, being able to write that one hit single or three hit singles is a magical thing. If you can do that, you'd want to do it again, wouldn't you? Some of the other pop stars I interviewed, people like Alex Kapranos from Franz Ferdinand, he said, as far as he's concerned, all pop stars have enormous egos and they have to indulge those egos and wear better than on stage at Glastonbury in front of 100,000 people. Yes. But the whole point and why I was so curious about this is, is inevitably, uh, for almost everyone, it it shifts and it stops. And that's yes. why, you know, and how do you feed that? And so there you had this quote, this was so good. Lewis, is it in your article that um, from, or maybe it's when I looked this up, it was the New Yorker, Lewis Minnett, the, the definition of stardom, the intersection of personality with history, a perfect congruence of the way the world happens to be and the way the star is. The world, however, moves on. 
I thought that was amazing. I mean, so that is the, the only, you know, constant is change kind of thing. And so that's why I was so curious about this because so many people have described where it's because you fall back in love with the process, yeah, not the result, yeah, right. And and I and then I think for anyone listening, that is the whole point: is that it's it's the art, it's the doing. Yeah, and as I said earlier, many of the people that I interviewed never particularly wanted to be famous; they just wanted to be recognized for the fact that they were very good at what they did. Yeah, let's talk about that. The difference between the two. Fame and recognition. That's really interesting. It is, isn't it? Yeah. I, I don't know if you can have one without the other in, in an arena like music. Do you? If you're if you're good at something and you and I get to hear it at a record company level, we want the radio stations to hear it. We want the journalists to hear it, to write about it. And then it gets on the radio and we all like it. Then you become famous. So how do you, you know, Sia is, has done quite a good job over the last few years of trying to avoid that. She it's a most amazing voice. And I interviewed her years and years ago, and she told me that she only ever wanted to write songs for other people. She never wanted to be front of microphone. And it happened. And so she did it in in, in a fairly ingenious way with, you know, the world's longest fringe. And she did her very best to remain anonymous. Daft Punk have done it in, in, in another really ingenious way. But yeah, I guess mostly it's it's unavoidable because your face is your passport. Again, Alex Kapranos said that um, pop and the industry, and you will know this as well as I do, if not better, given your record company past, they, as we said before about the cheekbones, they do like a band, an act to look good, and they will put you front and centre. And lots of the people I interviewed for the book found that not only were they cursed with the talent of being able to write a good song, but they look really good in black and white. So... Of course, you know, they look good in videos. They look good on, on posters. So we put them up on their wall and suddenly they became pinups. And at one point they would think, I, I never wanted this. I just wanted to be there strumming my guitar and stroking my muse. And now all of a sudden I'm a pop star on top of the pops and I'm forced to mime and make videos that we don't really believe in. So it's that was another reason why it was so fascinating to interview these bands a few years down the line back in my early journalism career. because. That's the point at which they became slightly more disillusioned and they realized that as artists, they were in an industry and they had to work within that industry and accept the rules. And I actually think we could go and get so deep in the weeds just about what's unique about the music industry and the business of music, which is unique to other creatives because you don't actually own your product. Someone else does. And, and so that's a becomes a deep, deep, separate other conversation, because I would think, well, one, every artist I've ever worked with wanted to share their their art with the world. Like, it'd be awesome to have, you know, like every 10 billion people know your work. But it's just it's just like the price of what that is. And it, it's yeah. also dependent on the genre, because you can be a highly acclaimed jazz artist, for instance, and my husband minored in jazz in college and, you know, hugely famous people were his professors. And so there's just like a a different way of seamless intersections that you don't quite have the same baggage that comes along with. I think country music back in the day had a little bit more of an intersection with the fans and integrated into life and not quite, there's a, there's just a a weird, you know, mythic thing that happens um, specifically like in the popular music world. But so I want to talk about, because some of the things that came out that um, one of the things I love was for many people is the notion of pivoting towards your fans, like Suzanne Vega. A lot of people talk about that. And, and that goes back to my notion of like fame versus recognition Yeah, is like you're creating and, and these are people who, you know, love and appreciate what you do, which is separate than the, the celebrity side of it, if that yeah. makes sense. Absolutely. And then I also started to think about this and I was prepping for this today is again, different genres, but there's also, you know, I think about somebody like Jay-Z or Tyler, the creator and a number of other since then artists coming up who really see this as, um, you know, an ecosystem, right? So I create my music and I love that, but I have multiple businesses and I, it's a very empowering approach which is incredible and also very different than the um, sort of anti-business approach of music when I was growing up. Yeah. But I was curious to you, if you emerged, just who you thought has transitioned really well. You're like, oh, that's a good blueprint for how to, you know, be a happy musician, former pop star. There, there were many. I don't think anyone would admit to really missing the fame, the craziness of fame. So yes, absolutely. They may 
be a little, they may come back down to earth with a bump when they arrive at JFK and there's no car to pick them up anymore because they're not a VIP. So they have to take a taxi in the same way that I would. But to, to get off that merry-go-round that we talked about earlier, I think everybody finds it really freeing, especially if they are the kind of musician who wants to do this for life. And Suzanne Vega was a wonderful example and she, she was a fantastic interview. She was so, I'd always, you know, I'd loved her first album and I'd, so I'd followed her ever since then. And she she explained to me that by 1990, she was growing in confidence and in stature. She'd been able to sell out everywhere. So she then announced her biggest tour to date and it didn't sell out. And she was really shocked and she thought, well, what did I do wrong? And of course, she hadn't done anything wrong at all. She had done everything so right that the industry were, was reminded once again, as it is on a cyclical basis, that there's nothing more powerful than than an artist in touch with their emotions. So now all of a sudden there were, there were these other young singer-songwriters coming up in her stead. And so we, the audience, were going to see them instead because we'd seen Suzanne Vega three years before. And this is one of those industries, quite an unusual one, like we were saying earlier, where you build up this core fan base that in very, very often will sustain you forever. So it may not be as big as it was in the early days, but it's still comparatively huge. And there will be people who will buy everything you do. Um, they will go to every concert you put on every few years, and that will be enough to sustain a career. And obviously, Suzanne Vega has done way you know, above and beyond that. But she seemed to me an artist. I think she's 62 now. So she peaked commercially in 1990 so many years have gone but I don't ever get the sense that she's had a frustrating career she's indulged herself she's done whatever she wanted to do she put on she did something maybe it was on Broadway a Carson McCuthers she adapted uh, a Carson McCuthers novel or something like that and but you know this is something she would never have been able to do after Marlena on the Wall or Tom's Diner because then there was a format she had to follow a particular kind of thing she had to behave like a pop star when she's an artist with the inverted commas around art, that word, she can do whatever the hell she likes and there will be that fan base there to support her. Over here, um, Billy Bragg was somebody I interviewed. Who, Billy Bragg was in a, you know, a fiery political songwriter from the 1980s who particularly, who wrote protest songs against Margaret Thatcher and the conservative government of, of the era. So when she was deposed in 1990, he had to realize that his job, his work here was done. What was he going to do? You know, so he pivoted as well. For a start, he took a few years off. He, I think, he settled down with his partner. They had a, a child, and so he just stayed at home. And then he kind of thought, well, do I do more of the same, or can I, can I pivot? And I was going to say fate played a part, but of course, fate never really plays a part. When you're successful, people get to hear about you. So Woody Guthrie's daughter heard about him. She, I think she'd seen him sing with R.E.M. or maybe she'd heard his, you know, his 1980s albums. And after discovering a whole load of lyrics from her late, her late father's estate, she asked if he would like to put them to music. And eventually he did with Wilco. And Wilco introduced him to a brand new audience, an American audience, which allowed him to delve into his love of Americana. And so he has had two completely different careers in a way. He writes books now. He writes opinion pieces for The Guardian every now and then, which upsets some people, but reminds people that Billy Bragg is still out there. He still regularly goes on picket lines and protest things because that's what Billy Bragg does. And when I interviewed him, he occasionally would talk about himself in the third person because he knew that he was to a certain extent a brand. But, you know, he manages himself where his wife manages him. And he's also unusual in that I think he owns all the rights to his songs. So even though he may not get very much money on Spotify because nobody does, he gets more than other people because he's been a very wily and clever entrepreneur. And I think that's what happens when the pop years finish. You become an entrepreneur. So several of the other um, artists I interviewed, they will sell bits and pieces on their website. So Lloyd Cole, who was alongside the Smiths, Lloyd Cole and the Commotions were this erudite, you know, um, really interesting band who wrote brilliant, brilliant songs. He will handwrite lyrics and sell them on his website. 
and that will sustain him. Obviously, in addition to that, he records albums, he plays regularly. Every now and then he'll get back together with some members of the commotions and play the old hits again. But otherwise, he's very forward thinking and he's able to take it forward because, yes, they've developed a business now by necessity. And that's what I meant earlier when I said there is kind of so much to admire here because at no stage are they failures. They've they've gone through peaks and troughs. And also they are extraordinarily successful because they've done something I could never dream of doing. They've to touch that many people. And now they're on a second part of the stage of their career, third and fourth, and they are still creating and they're still creative. Oh, that was so beautifully said, Nick. You know, and one of the definitions of success, honestly, is asking yourself, how much time do I spend during the day doing what I want to do versus having to do what I don't want to do? Yeah. And um, and to your point, they're all successful. And then so just to bring it back is what I'm really taking away from all this is passion, process, and, and staying focused in that, because then that's when it becomes universal is that we will all have transitions. Yeah, they have we'll a laser have, focus. Yes, very much. Yeah. Yes. And we will come up and down. So now I want to pivot myself a little bit to your own process, because I and then so in doing my research and discovering you, thanks to your article in The Guardian, I was really interested in the, in all the topics you write about and, the, and any through lines for you, because one, it was really beautiful, was The Smallest Things on the Enduring Power of Family, a book about your grandparents. Dishing the dirt, I was fascinated. The hidden lives of house cleaners. Again, shining a spotlight on people and something that we don't normally observe or look at. Your adventures in alternative health care. And also the notion of a life less lonely. And what can we do to all lead more connected, kinder lives, which I thought was beautiful and deeply thematic. And by the way, music has been through the pandemic was so helpful to me. So I'm grateful to so many of the people who you interviewed for your book for helping me, sustaining me. So I was just curious in your own process and what makes you, what calls you to write about what you write about? Um, I suppose as, as a journalist, I love telling people's stories. And because I spent so much of my time interviewing pop stars whose lives are very well documented, I started to want to tell people whose lives aren't particularly documented. So that the, the book that you mentioned earlier, The Dishing the Dirt, was I spent a year talking to, to house cleaners in London because I'd, I remember seeing a, a Stephen Frears film from the, I think it was the late 90s or the early noughties, uh, Dirty Pretty Things. And it was about people who come to London, uh, undocumented immigrants, and they work uh, either as cleaners or as minicab drivers or in the basement of posh hotels where they clean or, and they cook and they're never seen by anybody else. And I remembered I used to travel a lot for work. So I used to take lots of early morning buses to the airport to, you know, to fly to America. And I remember the very first time I took a bus, I think, well, it's four in the morning. At least it will be empty. I'll have the bus to myself. Instead, it was absolutely full with cleaners going to work. So they were almost like these ghosts that we would never see during the day. So they were getting offices and public spaces ready for everybody else. And then they would disappear. And I just thought, I, yeah, I kind of really wanted to know what their lives must be like. What must it be like to leave your country of birth and try to make it elsewhere? And I suppose I had a slightly vested interest in that particular subject. My mum was born in Yugoslavia, raised in Italy and couldn't wait to leave for various reasons. So she came to London. My wife is Spanish and she came for six months and then unfortunately met me. So she stayed. So, you know, it, it's fascinating to to talk to people who start life again and with the cleaners book, I found that if you arrive here and you can't speak English, no matter what you did in your home country, whether, you know, and what you, because a lot of them left because of poverty, because of war, uh, for all sorts of reasons. And they, they had all sorts of decent jobs back home, but they would come to London, couldn't really speak the language. So they fell right down the bottom of the ladder and they could only take the most basic work. And the most basic work was cleaning. So it was quite a, a rude second awakening for them. But I suppose a little bit like the the pop star book, a lot of them thrived. They went on to found their own com cleaning companies and then they brought family members over. They sent money back. And I just found it incredibly inspiring to talk to them and yeah, to learn how people lead their lives. And um, yeah, I, it felt like a valuable project to do. So I was quite glad to do that one. You know, obviously, we've only just met on this podcast, but I have to say in, in our conversation, I realized you bring a tremendous amount of humanity and compassion 
to the work that you do. I don't know if you stopped to think about that. I know that you're British, so you're not as navel gazing as we are <laughs> over here. But um, because obviously between pop stars and your cleaners, you build a lot of trust with your subjects. That's that's difficult to do, especially because an interview is quite an artificial time. You know, I get you get to spend more time with people outside the public eye than within the public eye. You know, people within the public eye are quite rightly mistrustful of journalists and I wanted very much with this pop stars book to write my own book but I want, didn't want to do them a disservice in any way I wanted to be as empathetic as I possibly could and listen to them and and let them speak on the page because in this particular book a lot of them said that they don't really get to talk about this you know the the pop star narrative is one of uh, awards and stadium shows and what it's like to wear sunglasses indoors, you know, all of the, that kind of ephemeral stuff. I wanted to talk about more personal things. So I, I you know, I, I owe so much to them for opening up to me. And I suppose that those are the kind of stories that, that really interest me. Where do we find you and your books? Um, I'm sort of online. Uh, it's the world's most basic and cheapest website. And it doesn't work really well. And my wife, who is my technical department and everything else very kindly updated from because I have no idea what I'm doing and it doesn't work entirely well. But yeah, my website is is my name. So it's nickdurden.co.uk, I think. And I am on Twitter. Um, yeah, and that's about it, I think. Well, we're here at Camera Ready and Able to amplify and to encourage everyone to find your books because I was able to find online and there is global shipping and, and Kindle downloads. So I'm really, really happy. And congratulations on Exit Stage Left. And very excited to read your other work, Nick. Look, thank you so much. Thanks for, for your time. I really appreciate you talking to me. My pleasure. And I want to thank you for listening to Camera Ready and Able. Please visit ableintermedia.com and download my free book, e- free ebook, excuse me, 12 Tips for Success on Camera. And as always, please be sure to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already.